Shabbat Shalom. <clears throat> Today I want to talk about the story of Moses and his Ethiopian wife, Aisha Kushit, which is uh, told in the Torah at the end of Parashat Bahalotcha, the beginning of chapter 12 of the Book of Numbers, Bamidbar. In this story, <clears throat> Moses' siblings, his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron, talk about Moses in connection with her in the matter of the, the his taking in a Ethiopian wife. God then scolds Miriam and punishes her, but he also gives an explanation. We don't always get explanations for punishment, but here we do. And the explanation concerns the how and why of Moses being the greatest prophet ever. So what happened? What is the story of the Ethiopian wife? Uh, what does it have to do with prophecy? And why was Miriam alone punished? These questions jump out uh, from the text, from the biblical text. And since antiquity, uh, Jewish scholars have been trying to give answers, and we will talk about that in what follows. Now, two pieces of the puzzle are supplied by very ancient uh, Jewish sources. Uh, one is found in the Aramaic translation, the Targum of Onkelos, roughly around the beginning of the Christian era, who in his translation of, of the verse adds that Moses took this wife and verachik, he divorced her, he abandoned her. So that's one piece of the puzzle. The second piece is provided by the Midrash in giving a background story that relates to the topic that the Torah spoke about before turning to the story of Moses and Miriam and Aaron. In this story, Moses complains to God about the great burden, the almost impossible task of leading the Jewish people by himself. And God, in response, causes a, a spirit, ruach, to diffuse among the people, and people begin prophesizing throughout the, the camp. When news comes to Moses about this, or people report to him that the, the Eldad and Medad are prophesying. Uh, Miriam happened to be standing there along with Moses and Moses' wife, Zipporah. And when, when uh, Zipporah heard this, Zipporah, Moses' wife, said, Oh, I feel sorry for their wives, because now that they're prophets, they're not going to, these men, will, their husbands will abandon them. They won't, have, they won't be intimate with them anymore. They don't want to have uh, relations with women because they're prophets. When And Miriam uh, heard this, and she told this to her brother Aaron, and said that, that you know, this doesn't, uh, what, what, what's going on here? I mean, we, Miriam and Aaron, are also prophets, yet we lead normal family lives with, with spouses. So what's going on here? So, putting these points together, these two bits of information, we can see that, one, Miriam was punished because she initiated the whole story. She was the one who, when she heard uh, Moses' wife, Zipporah, a voice her complaint, spoke to Aaron. Uh, two, that the uh, talk was not about Moses' uh, marriage, his, his wife, but rather uh, uh, about is abandoning this, his wife, about his not car keep, uh, carrying on with the usual uh, relationship between uh, a, a, a man and his wife. And three, that something connected to prophecy was connected to this with Moses choosing to be celibate again and not have any relations, marital relations with his wife. Now, I would like to briefly digress here and talk about how these two uh, passages that I cited, one the Aramaic translation, the other the Midrash, uh, contain elements that become in 500 or 800 or whatever years later, become uh, techniques or tools in, in the hermeneutics of the Quran. They become tools that are used to elucidate difficult passages uh, in the Quran. Uh, the addition of a, of a single word which flips the meaning of the verse, which is what the Targum does, 
uh, is included in, in a technique which in uh, the uh, Quranic hermeneutics is called takdir. Takdir, which then made its way back into a Hebrew uh, interpretation as shi'ur hakatuv. And I, anyone who really wants to hear about this more, uh, just leave a note in the comments and I'll explain. But this is this has become a technique where one assumes that a certain word which does not appear in the text is implied or is for whatever reason invisible, and adding that word will either elucidate a, a, a phrase that is otherwise incomprehensible, or as in our case, and in the case of one of the key verses of the Quran about Ramadan, will change the meaning of the of of, of the of the verse, give it take a hundred and eighty degree turn to get things in line with the interpretation we're looking for. The second the Midrash, which supplies a background story which the Torah does not give us, and which very, very extremely helpful in trying to understand the context, again becomes in Quranic interpretation this body of 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 uh, of uh, narratives that are called as Baba Nuzul, the circumstances under which a certain verse uh, was revealed, and uh, once again this becomes in, we look at, at Midrash as. I don't know expansion or whatever, but here it's really it's a case of of giving us a background story that makes sense, helps us understand a story that otherwise would be very very difficult to understand. Now, just how, if, and how, and why, and when <coughs> these uh, elements of Jewish interpretation or uh, of the scripture became uh, uh, morphed into. Uh, techniques for Quranic exegesis is something that I won't dare touch, but I thought I would share this with you. Now, I would like to end with what I, what I think is a brilliant piece of biblical interpretation by Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, the great the German rabbi of the 19th century, who actually gets the same understanding of the story of Moses and his Ethiopian wife and how it connects to his his prophecy and his uh, uh, deserting or divorcing his Ethiopian wife. Uh, he gets it out of the text itself, uh, almost in a matter of pshat, of, of a surface reading, without uh, having to have recourse to the techniques that we saw in the Targum or in the Midrash. Uh, here are just the two key points. The first point concern, it con connects to the, to the connection between Prophecy and celibacy, prophecy and being married or, or not being married, having marital relations or not having marital relations, and the special status of Moses in this regard. And he calls our attention to the fact that at Har Sinai, at the Mount of Sinai during the Revelation, at, before the Revelation, the entire Jewish people who would have each, each really re reached some degree of, of, uh, of, of theophany of prophecy were commanded for three days, uh, not to have any intimacy uh, with their spouses. After the revelation in Har Sinai, uh, God said to the people, shivu, shivu lachem lachem, go back to your tents, which which is taken to mean resume normal family life. But Moses was told, Batapo, Amodi Madi, you stay here with me. So we see here a connection between prophecy and celibacy, but also that it's it, it, except in the special circumstances of of the revelation, it really applied to Moses alone that he had to be totally uh, devoted to and totally attached to God and cannot even have intimacy with his with his wife. Now the second uh, piece of the puzzle that uh, Shimshon Ophel Hirsch supplies from the story itself in Baalotcha in chapter twelve of Numbers has to do with the prepositional phrase whereby which the Torah tells us that uh, uh, Miriam and Aaron spoke in the matter in the matter of a concerning the Ethiopian wife. Al Odot Isha Kushit. Al Odot is this prepositional phrase that comes before the phrase of the uh, Ethiopian wife. And uh, Rabbi Hirsch points out that in the Bible, Al Odot always refers to speaking about not just a certain individual, but about the suffering of that individual. And he gives several examples. 
So the pshat of Aladot Aisha Kushit means they they spoke about the suffering, the pain of the Ethiopian wife. And what was the pain? The pain was that her husband uh, simply would not be intimate with her anymore. So I think he he, he has shown that we can actually get the the main stories, the main the main outline of the of the story directly from the the uh, uh, the biblical text without any uh, hermeneutical acrobatics. And I think it's it's a wonderful piece of exegesis. Now, whether this it's the Isha Kushi, the Ethiopian wife, refers to a, a different woman that, that Moses took, or whether it actually refers back to Tsipora, because many uh, uh, interpret Kushi to mean beautiful, black is beautiful. And so calling Tsipora uh, the Ethiopian wife, does, or the black wife, does not mean that she was Ethiopian or dark-skinned, but that she was beautiful. That's a that's a whole different topic. But I, I think that, the, that at this time, uh, Rabbi Shimshon Afral Hirsch really uh, hit the nail on the head. Thank you very much, and Shabbat Shalom.